Hello and welcome to Spotlight. My name is Nwong Falong. Monday, Election Day, is almost upon us when you get to decide which political candidate and which political ideologies will lead Ghana into the next four years of her development. Over here in the last few weeks on Spotlight, we have spoken to various political candidates and we are putting a cap to the political series today by speaking with the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, also former president, John Dramani Mahama. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Thank you, Noong. Noong Falong. Noong. No, I just wanted to get the name right. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, you... Noong is something sweet, eh? Yes. No. It's something sweet. Yeah. It's, it also means to bloom. Mm. It also means flourish. Yeah. So it's a Dagati word. Okay. It depends usually a lot on the context. Yeah, and the, um, how you pronounce it. Yes. Mm. Uh, in my context, to flourish. Okay. Um, yesterday, during the signing of the peace pact, you lamented some outstanding uh, recommendations of the short commission that were not implemented. Uh, some people think this is you throwing out a caveat to the pact. Would you say so? No. Um, we're signing a peace treaty for nonviolence in elections. And um, we needed to put it in context and um, come out with what our anxieties were. And so I had to point out some of these things that had been unresolved, you know, coming out of what happened in Ayawaso West Wogo. Um, government came out with a white paper on the short commission report, rejecting almost 60% of the recommendations. And so you would wonder, why do you have an independent commission when you reject most of its findings? And um, we know of no sanctions taken against the people who were involved in what happened in uh, Iowasu West Morgan. Um, an honorable member of parliament was assaulted on video. We saw who assaulted him. Nothing has been done to the person. But um, at least we had the vigilante bill coming out of it, a law uh, which now criminalizes vigilantism. That's uh, some positive aspect to it. Well, we have the vigilante um, law, but the point is for, for those who did what they did, the impunity of it continues to exist. And aside from that, um, if you look at during the registration exercise, you could see that it occurred again. Um, people stabbed a student to death and is a vigilante of one of the parliamentary candidates. And no action has been taken let, so far. Let me backtrack you a little. The uh, shooting at Nkran Kwanta, you know, led to the death of one person. One person has been permanently disabled. That also is a fallout from the kind of violence that we saw in Iowa so West Oregon. So there's always a danger. I needed to so raise the red I needed to raise the red flag, you know, so that government can take cognition of it and be able to take whatever steps it will take in order that we have a peaceful election. So for you, do you think this is still outstanding and you think government still needs to uh, step up and make those changes? Well, we're not expected to come there and sing hallelujah and be all lovey-dovey as if everything is right and there's not going to be the threat of any violence. You know, after I talked, I said, let me, be, but prove me wrong. That was my word. I said, prove me wrong. I said there's an anxiety that this could happen because of these unresolved issues, but I wish to be proved wrong. So you, you feel the unresolved issues uh, cast a bit of a shadow over the entire exercise. Let me take you back a little bit uh, to uh, our now late uh, President Rawlings. Yeah. There's some public perception out there that you two had a terse relationship. Is that what you would call it? How yeah. would you describe the relationship you two had? We had a great relationship. And um, we were on good terms when I was president. He used to come home when he had any concerns and sit with me on my dining table. And um, he used to come in and order his coffee before I come down and see him. Oh, the, but there's a feeling that he did not robustly support you. Well, um, in 2016, you can say he didn't robustly support us. And um, of course, some of his comments were not very complimentary. 
And so you can say that for 2016. Would you say some of his comments hurt your image in any way? Well, uh, considering the role he plays in our party, you know, if some of those comments were made, I wouldn't say that it didn't have an impact on our fortunes. But um, post-2016, you know, we've had a good relations. I've gone to him in Tefle several times. Oh, so you think post-2016 he tried to repair uh, the comments he made? No, even, even during 2016, even though he made those comments, it did not damage our relationship. It didn't. You know, it's not every time we agreed. Like in any human relationship, it's not any time, every time you agree. Um, he had some views on um, some changes that needed to be done in the military. But as Commander-in-Chief and Head of the National Security Secretariat, the, in the intelligence I had, you know, showed something to the contrary. And so it's not all the time that he made a suggestion or a view that I took it hook, line, and sinker and implemented it. So there were those disagreements, you know, I told him to do this, he didn't do it, you know, and that kind of thing. More recently, you've, you've voiced some reservations about the Electoral Commission's uh, position. What is your main reservation? Uh, their position on what? On, uh, you, you have made comments to suggest uh, you do not completely trust their neutrality. Um, what exactly have they done to give you that impression? It's the posturing of the commission. The posturing of the commission don't, doesn't give us confidence about their impartiality. One of the commissioners said our party, NDC, is the greatest threat to democracy in Ghana. I mean, how can a commissioner say that? And you think that I should think that they are impartial? Uh, would you say... They, they, they go to IPAC and encourage parties that were long dead to resurrect just because they want to carry majority decisions in IPAC. I think that I should believe in their impartiality. Some people think it's more of a politics of equalization because Charlotte Say was not much supported by the MPP. Is that what it is? Charlotte pulled off a successful election with the MPP won. And so she was vindicated in the end. The MPP, we had done a new register in 2012. And in 2016, just the next election, they wanted us to discard the re register, a new register. They wanted us to discard it in 2016 after four years of use, you know. And, I mean, it wasn't on. Let me be more specific. Does the MPP's treatment of Charlotte say in any way contribute to your opinion of the EC today? No, no, no. No, no. I mean, I felt that the MPP's removal of Charlotte of Say was arbitrary. It wasn't necessary. I mean, you don't remove a head of an institution for procurement breaches in the institution. Then every minister would have been removed by now because there are procurement breaches in all the ministries. That's exactly what happened. Procurement breaches in EC, and because of that, you remove the three commissioners. So I didn't agree with the removal of Shadow, but the president had done it, appointed a new commission. I was prepared to give them the benefit of the doubt. But right from the start, it's either incompetence because they are new and inexperienced to the job, or partiality towards the, the ruling government because they were appointed by them. And so the posturing of the commission, the comments they've made. But if, if partiality is towards uh, the person who appointed you, one could easily say that of, of Charlotte say because she was appointed by the NDC. Also. Well, I mean, Charlotte had worked with um, National Commission for Democracy during Justice Annan's time. And then she became the director of NCC, if you remember, before she took the job as Electoral Commission. NCC and Electoral Commission have worked closely for a long time. She has experience of Afarijan's work and all that. Oh, essentially you, you, you feel she was more qualified? Oh, no, she came with a lot of competence to that job. And, um, Jean does not? Jean has been in the CSO sector. And so she is not a person who has run any electoral systems or been associated with any electoral systems. As NCC director, NCC carries out the public relation and education for voters on behalf of the Electoral Commission, you know that. So I'm saying that Charlotte came with a lot more pedigree, you know, and experience to the job than Jean came. But like I said, I mean, that's all in the past. Let's move. I'm coming. I was prepared to give them a chance, you know, if they showed in word and deed that 
they were neutral and you know impartial to any political party. Unfortunately, I've given you the grounds that makes me believe one the posturing, the comments. You know, you have a live microphone on, and you hear the comments between the two. Oh, tell them this. Tell them this. You know, you had you had that <laughs> you know live microphone. Uh -huh. So it makes you feel that I mean there's something unto it. But like I said. I'm prepared to give the benefit of the doubt. That's why we've gone along. There have been very many infractions in the processes leading up to the election. We point them out, but we go along because we don't want to append Ghana's constitutional democracy. But on the day, that is tomorrow, we'll see uh, whether they perform to the level that Ghana's electoral commission you know, has been known to achieve. More recently, you have upgraded your Chimpe policy to a Faninina uh, policy. Faninina is... only for first years. What happens after the first years? No, 2020, the... 2021. What no, happens no, after? You see, it's, po it's part of our post-COVID relief package. It's a, a post-COVID relief package. It's not meant to be a permanent thing. We know that because of COVID... So it's more of a short-term policy? No, no, no. It is. It's 20, uh, academic year 2020, 2021. You know, COVID has had an impact on businesses. And so a lot of people have loved their jobs. If you take the private schools, many of the teachers have been sitting at home for how many months without any salary. And so they might have a child that is going to university, and then suddenly they are faced with all these fees they have to pay. And so we said for continuing students, second year to fourth year, will absorb half of the fees. It will come to about 400 million, odd million Ghana cities. And then for the first years, because their fee structure is much higher, they have to pay admission fees, you know, and then uh, look for accommodation and all that. They have a more unique case. And so our education committee recommended that for first years, for 2020, 2020 2021, we should absorb the fees. And so we put it out. The NPP uh, insists that you, you, the, the NDC had uh, a bit of intelligence on their scholarship package that they announced later, and that was why you came out uh, with the Faninina policy. Then was, maybe they had intelligence on our package, and that's why they came out with this. But, I mean, it was something our education committee recommended. You also and, mentioned uh, this uh, 400 million. Is it cities or...? Cities. or uh, we are already battling with a huge uh, debt burden. Yeah. These, uh, there seems to be a lot of freebies going around in the promises leading to election. Doesn't this increase the burden on, on the budget deficit? Um, it does, but um, you need to give a stimulus you know, to individuals and the economy so that then you can have them begin to come back to normality. And so it will be worth the investment. We have costed all, it, all of that. And we're looking at other means of generating revenue. How, how is it worth the investment when we don't see uh, a clear part of it, how it pays back uh, on the Like investment? I'm saying, it's a one-off. And so it's not going to be a recurring expenditure. It's a one-off. And so we're going to find monies to pay it. It eases the burden on parents so that they can concentrate on whatever businesses they are, they are doing. People have lost money in the banking sector due to the financial uh, clean-out. There are people who have lost their jobs. There are parents who are not working today because they were um, uh, thrown out of work following the financial sector clean-out. There's a social cost that you can never discount about the impact it has on citizens in your economy. And you cannot put a value to that. And so we'll invest in that in order to give them the relief they deserve. Recent polls have not favored you. Uh, the University of Ghana polls, Beneficence polls haven't favored you. There was a recent Iris uh, academic research, uh, which actually puts 11 percentage points between you and the flag bearer of the NPP. How do you react to these polls? When you look at a lot of those polls, you find that the category of undecided or I don't know is quite huge. Mm, mm. Until you disaggregate that category, you're not really going to get a reliable poll because you need to find out, go beyond and find out. And so- you Are you saying these polls are not reliable? Oh, I mean, polls have been proved very wrong. You know that. I mean, there are many polls where they have predicted a winner and somebody else has emerged. 
And I'm saying that in most of those polls, the group of undecided is, is, is low. In most of the scientific polls that are done in developed countries and things, when you go to undecided, I don't know, it's very low. But here in Africa, we have a certain suspicion when people come asking you questions. And people are very reluctant to disclose their political identities, especially if they will vote for the opposition. You know that. I've done uh, communications research statistics mm. when I was in school, and so I know how these things happen. And so when you see a high undecided, like 12%, in some cases 15%, you need to disaggregate that to see where that will swing before you can make you know, a definitive statement that this person will win or that person will win. But like I said, polls, you know, sometimes get very dangerous, get it very dangerously wrong. That's true. Um, and um, the, we are hopeful. We've been on the ground. We know what the response to us is. And your, res your response on the ground has been positive? It's been very positive. And um, often, um, why I say so is that often when you're in government, you get a skewed picture of what the ground is like because you have DCEs, you have all kinds of government officials in all the districts. And so when the president is coming, first lady is coming, vice president is coming, they have the resources, they send buses, bring people and come to meet you and, you know, they are following and, you know, singing your praises and all that. Sometimes you can get it dangerously wrong. I mean, we are in opposition. We don't did have... You, did you experience we don't that have the kind in 2016? Of, oh, 2016, when we went, the crowds were there, you understand? But I'm just telling you some of the underlying factors that your appointees on the ground will probably have organized to make sure that they give a good showing because the so president is coming. So you don't get a true coming. picture of so what you don't get a true the picture. sentiments are. But when you're in opposition and you don't have the kind of resources, you understand, you go to a community and those who turn out are people who have genuinely come out to come and listen to you and see you. And so you get a better picture of what the response uh, to you is than when you're in government. And I think that going around our message has been received properly. The turnout, the enthusiasm, the motivation of the people. What key policies do you me. think that people have responded to more? Oh, they've responded to a lot of our policies, especially to do with job creation. Job creation is the number one issue for Ghanaian voters. Um, we did our own sampling, and job creation was number one. Education was number two. Health was number three. Um, corruption was number four. And then after that, electricity, water, and all those things. And so um, it's job creation. And so they've responded to the issue about creating more jobs, uh, crop processing zones. Um, they've responded to farmers' mechanization centers to improve farmer uh, productivity. They've responded to the big push. The big push is particularly mm. popular. Mm. Um, they've responded to free primary health care. You know, they've responded to free technical vocational education training, and especially the National Apprenticeship Program because um, one of the major things you see the hawkers selling menial at uh, doing menial hawking on the road you ask them you know why are you doing this don't you have any better plans didn't you go to school Everyone and they say oh, we better. want to sell so that we can get a little money and go and pay they have something they call trihunsa when you go to learn you mm, pay your master mm, mm. you know a certain fee and then you bring some scissors and if it's hairdressing scissors you bring some towels and things you know, and so they don't have money to do it, the parents don't have. And so they have to come and do some menial jobs to be able to raise that money. And so we're saying that, look, we're going to train, you know, as many of them as we can in the manifesto. It says to so that, that training sound will be free? Yes. You're we, absorbing we, it. We will pay the masters and will attach the... You know, the, the LPG problem is the same thing. Uh, uh, Kofi Akwalu of the LPG, is, he's a minority candidate. He also promised he's going to pay uh, to insert for everyone who wants to study apprenticeship. Well, I don't know what his manifesto is. I haven't heard mm. about his manifesto. I mean, I know what we, we, we have done. We had a manifesto committee that had been working since 2019. Your manifesto in 2020 seems to have resonated uh, majorly with the people compared to previous years. Would you say um, opposition gives you a more acute view of the people's needs? No, it's the nature, it's the, the method we use to compile the manifesto. Um, in previous years, we set up a manifesto committee of experts, and they sat and did a draft, and um, it came for the approval of the functional executive committee 
and then once we had approved it, we launched it. This time we decided that we we're going to come out with a people's manifesto. And so the methodology we used was to meet different groups from different walks of life. And we started as far back as 2019. We met chiefs, we met religious leaders, we met CSOs, we met uh, labor organizations, we met So you drafted drivers. the manifesto based on their needs? And so they came up with a lot of issues. Indeed, if we had taken all the issues on board, we would have a manifesto this thick. But what we did was we sieved and picked out the most important issues. Some not practical, we discarded. Others, you know, we fine-tuned because the way they put it, maybe it wasn't feasible to do it like that. So we fine-tuned them. And so we did all that. And then when we finished, we put it together. And so you can imagine a manifesto that was drawn out of the participation of the people. And that is why it resonated. And indeed, our opponents made it resonate more because then instead of talking about this, they had launched this a week before us. They started talking about us and trying to critique our manifesto. And so that made it topical. And everybody was discussing it and we were explaining what was in the manifesto. So amongst all the political parties, I would say our manifesto is the best known. Why did you change the strategy, is, is my point. Um, it came to me... Um, That's what I was asking. When if we, when perhaps did, opposition gives you a more we started you know, something viable... We, call, we started something we call the speak out. And this was supposed to be a listening tour, just to listen to the people. But as we started doing the speak out, I realized that the ideas that were coming from the people, the ordinary people, we get a big town hall, we have doctors, we have teachers, we have nurses, we have mechanics, we have civil engineers, we have chiefs, everybody in the hall. And we put them in focus groups and we tell them, write what is wrong with our country and don't mm. write. Mm. And we say, how do you think we can make our country better? And then they'll write. What are the main issues of concern to you? They'll write. So when we started synthesizing it, I said, wow, I mean, why don't we write our manifesto through this process? So then we dovetail the speak out session into the manifesto writing session. So anytime I was going for the speak out, we went with representatives of our manifesto committee. And then when they had synthesized what the people had said, the manifesto committee will take it and then go and continue their work. That's how it came out. Talking about your manifesto and the policies, you seem to have um, changed your mind on a few issues. For example, the legalization of uh, Okada, uh, which you wouldn't have agreed with before. Uh, also, teacher training allowances. Um, why the U turn? Um, there's not a U turn. Um, legalization of Okada, the new highway code, if I remember, was passed in 2010. Before that, I think the regulations that existed were from the 70s or 80s. It hadn't been updated for a long time. And so, when they did this new one, I don't remember if, you know, there was anything about using motorcycles for commercial purposes. But in the new one, it had been put there that motorcycles shall not be used for commercial. You can't take a commercial um, a passenger. So your previous decision was based on the outdated uh, regulations? In 2010, government, you understand, did not deliberately insert it there. It was the DVLA and all the stakeholders who came up with the new traffic uh, regulations. And they brought it to parliament and parliament approved it. And so it's not like government met in cabinet and took a decision that motorcycles should not do commercial business. I'm just trying to let you know that it wasn't a political decision. It was more a technocratic decision that the transport ministry held, uh, supervised the process and the highway uh, tra traffic regulations went to parliament and it was approved. Apparently in there, there was a clause that said that motorcycles cannot be used for commercial purposes. So motorcycles and tricycles to take passengers. You know, tricycles can take goods, but they're not supposed to take passengers. So that was in there. In 2010, as far back as 2010, I was vice president then. And it's been the case since then till now. Now what happened was when I was going around the country, I saw all these young boys at various junctions sitting on their motorcycles with their helmets waiting for passengers. And I saw them in so many places. And I said, but this thing is illegal. But it is going on. It is not something that you seem able to stop. So why must we behave like ostriches with our heads in the sand? 
you know, why don't we legalize and regulate it so that we're able to make it safer and able to make it an experience that people would want to have. And so one, identify which the commercial motorcycles are, because right now we don't know. You see a motorcycle with two people on, on, on it, it doesn't mean it's Okada. It might be his personal motorcycle is giving his friend the ride. So we can't tell the difference between the two. So legalize it first, and when you legalize it, you can identify which ones are commercial and which ones are not. You can change the number plate, you can put something on the motorcycle so that when you see the motorcycle, you know this is commercial. Help them to get licenses, make an insurance policy for them, so that if anything happens... But from this angle, someone would argue that it's easier to provide alternative forms of livelihood for them instead of restricting them to while you try to pre provide alternative i don't think that they want to ride motorcycles forever as okada operators but as the economy is picking up and you're creating jobs and finding them better jobs you can't say they shouldn't do that work you get my point yes they want better jobs but at the moment you don't have that space to put them in yet and so you don't go and prevent them from being able to look after themselves what about teacher trainee allowances Teacher training allowances, we've not made a new term. We have said that we could use that money to create more jobs for teachers and nurses. If you look at the uh, training allowances for nurses, um, in 2017, I think government paid 200 and something million, was budgeted to pay for it. Now, if you use that 270 something million, and you look at the pay of a, a newly recruited nurse, yeah? That money can recruit 14,000 nurses. And so I said, why use that money and pay them trainee allowances? And when they come out, you cannot recruit them. Why not use that money and pay them, recruit them and pay them with that money instead? You know, so that was the thinking behind it. Right. And so we, we said that, look, we're going to save this money so that we can use it and recruit more of you when you come out of work. But the, our opponents at the time said, no, no, no. We, when we come, we'll restore it. We'll pay it to you. And so they came and they restored it. And they you have agreed that if you come, you continue paying it. Listen, they are having difficulties paying anyway. It's normally in arrears for six months or more and all that. But that is what they have restored. Now, what we have said is that we'll maintain the status quo until we put an alternative on the table. That's because, a change of mind. No, it's not a change of mind. You get my point. The point is, policy must not be start and stop. We started a policy. Mm. This government came and changed it and restored it. It won't make sense for us to come and stop it abruptly. And so we're saying that when we come, We'll continue to pay the training allowances, but we're going to put a new offer on the table. What had happened was, at the time we stopped it, we had not sufficiently put the student loan plus on the table to cover them. And we needed to amend the Students' Loan Act in order that we can bring the trainee nurses on board. And we hadn't done that. So definitely that disruption in terms of the income they were getting from the allowances was going to be a problem. But what we want to do is that, we're going to put a new package for students' loan on the table. It's in our manifesto. And when we have done that and it's satisfactory to them, then we will transit everybody onto the student loan. But for the meantime, because this government has restored the allowances, we will not abruptly stop it. We'll maintain the status quo until, until you have an uh, alternative um, acceptable to everybody is on the table. Moving on, your opponents have accused you uh, of corruption. In fact, there have been several press conferences that uh pin you to the airbus scandal uh do you have any anything to do with the airbus scandal are you government official one as named in the airbus scandal who where who, in what Mus document has Mus anybody named? Uh, mustafa hamid of the mpp has mentioned you uh martin and honorable martin amidu has said the same thing the least said about mustafa hamid the better I mean, he should just concentrate on his own sordid past uh, and, and, and just not take any moral high ground to accuse anybody. I'm surprised that it's him they put up to do this kind of thing. You think he's not fit to accuse you? Oh, the rumors wondering? about him stealing from his flag bearer, he should address those issues before coming to talk about me. Honorable, what about Honorable Martin Amidu? 
Martin had no legal basis. What is his legal basis for determining that? He didn't say anything. He just put a paragraph there and said by his determination to so and so and so. What was the legal basis? And that's why I said, what is your legal basis? What investigation have you conducted? Who have you interviewed? Who have you spoken to? Nothing. There's nothing there. I haven't taken one dollar in respect of Airbus. No. Nope. I did my job to, my, to the satisfaction and followed all the procurement rules. We got the aircrafts at competitive rates. And so there's really no legal basis. Because some people have done a deferred procurement agreement, that is between them. You understand? And if Airbus decided to pay any persons, you know, for the aircraft we purchased, it had nothing to do with us. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for submitting yourself to Spotlight. We are most grateful Thank for you. your time. And you, you who is watching, we hope that this conversation has informed you to some extent in some manner. My name is Nuong Falong. On election day, stay safe, stay peaceful. Bye-bye.